Why do some people looking to build muscle gain more than others? Why do some bodybuilders gain faster than others? Mike Menser wrote about this phenomenon, so let's return to the Menser archives for the answer. A bodybuilder of any experience need not be told that the process of stimulating muscle growth beyond normal levels is slow indeed. It is, in fact, a harsh reality that the weight athlete is reminded of every day. And while it is patently true that some of us grow faster than others, no one grows fast enough for his or her liking. The physiological principles that mediate the muscle growth process apply to all humans. Because the biochemical changes resulting in muscle are the same in everyone, the basic training requirements for inducing growth are also essentially the same for everyone. But if the physiology underlying muscle growth is universal, and we all have practically the same training requirements, why do such dramatic differences in individual response to training exist? Genetic Traits The citadel of bodybuilding orthodoxy rests on impressive pillars, a few of which are beginning to show cracks, revealing themselves as monumental superstitions. One of these pillars has it that anyone can reach the top if only he or she can find the right training program. Implicit in this belief is the notion that we all require different training programs, and contingent upon our ability to discover such a program, everyone has the potential to become a bodybuilding champion. This belief has come under fire lately as a few facts derived from genetic science have cast a new light on the subject of a person's potential in bodybuilding. The mystery surrounding individual training requirements and differences in individual potential has been solved. The key is deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, the genetic material that determines our individual inherited traits. While the physiological principles involved in muscle are common to everyone, it is also true that there are genetic factors which modify individual response to exercise and training. Two of the most commonly recognized differences are race and sex. There are other factors, however, often less tangible, which play an even greater role in individual response to exercise. Individuals inherit characteristics peculiar to their parents and not common to the species as a whole. For example, facial appearance, hair color, body type, and blood type. These are fixed genetic traits and therefore are not subject to progressive alteration. There exist other inherited traits or tendencies, however, such as intelligence and muscle size, that are not fixed and can be altered. The genes, or hereditary material within a cell, responsible for mature body size, can find expression in an individual deprived of adequate nutrients during the early stages of growth. The same condition applies to a person's intelligence. Deprived of early intellectual stimulation, the intellect will not mature. These environmental influences are necessary to develop normal levels of physical size and intelligence. To develop above normal levels of size and intelligence, a person must expose himself or herself to demands and the performance of tasks greater than those encountered in daily living. By following the advice mentioned above, anyone can improve upon his or her existing levels of size and intellect. In all cases, however, limits will exist, and these limits are genetically predetermined. Nothing you can do can extend the upper reaches of your genetic limits. Aside from the psychological factors necessary to pursue any goal to fulfillment, there exists a constellation of genetic traits. This assemblage is the single most important consideration in building an award-winning physique. Though anyone can improve upon his or her existing level of physical development with proper training and nutrition, only those with an abundance of the required genetic traits will become champions. These traits are skeletal formation, physical proportions, somatotype, muscle fiber density, and muscle belly length. Skeletal Formation The most readily visible characteristic necessary in the building of a top physique is the skeletal structure. 
The size and formation of the individual's bones dictate how much muscle mass can be supported, as well as determine the aesthetic quality of the physique. A bodybuilder with a bone structure as small and as frail as Woody Allen's could never develop, let alone support, the musculature of the Hulk. One who possesses the tank-like skeleton of a Paul Anderson could most likely develop more muscle mass than a top bodybuilding champion. But, more important, such an individual could never acquire the aesthetic flow and taper of a large billowing muscle belly into a nice tight joint, the hallmark of a bodybuilder's physique. Physical Proportions Superior athletes in any sport possess physical proportions ideally suited to their sport. Sprinters usually have short torsos, narrow hips, and long legs. The ideal proportions of a middle linebacker would be a long torso, short legs, wide hips, and long arms. Being less performance athletes, bodybuilders require balanced proportions since their sport is more aesthetic. Somatotype Another genetic trait plainly evident is a person's body type. Characteristics included in a discussion of body types are percentage of body fat, bone length, thigh to lower leg ratio, and lean body weight. Such characteristics will play a major role in how far an aspiring competitive bodybuilder might go. These factors should not be central to the individual's enjoyment of bodybuilding, however. Body type assessment should be used only to establish expectations of success, which will give the individual a perspective on his training. Muscle fiber density. A genetic trait that's invisible is muscle fiber density, the number of fibers within a given volume of a muscle. One whose pectorals have one third the number of fibers of his training partners will still appear to have smaller pecs even if he doubles their size while his partners remain the same, provided the former's pecs were proportionately smaller to begin with. Some believe that hyperplasia, or the splitting of muscle fibers, can take place when a muscle is exposed to repeated contractions of a high-intensity nature. If hyperplasia did take place with any regularity, however, we would see advanced bodybuilders making dramatic improvements in chronically weak body parts since the increase in the number of fibers would increase the mass density potential of a muscle. This we never see. Length of the muscle. While it's the size of the skeleton that enables an individual to support massive muscles with great contractile power, the ultimate size a muscle might develop is dictated primarily by its length. The length of the muscle from where its tendon attaches at one end to where its tendon attaches at the other end that is what determines how much mass that particular muscle will have. Examples of muscle lengths easily measured are the biceps, the triceps, the forearm flexors, and the gastrocnemius. If you were to take a tape to 6 foot 5 inch Lou Ferrigno's biceps, you would find it to measure 9 inches in length, while 5 foot 3 Danny Padilla's would measure only 6 inches. Since Lou's biceps are 50% longer than Danny's, they possess the capacity to develop 2.25, or 1.5 times 1.5 times, the cross-sectional area, and 3.375, that is 1.5 times 1.5 times 1.5, times the volume of Danny's biceps. While Lou does have greater mass than Danny, however, that does not mean that his biceps appear more massive for his height. The subject of muscle length is interesting when you consider randomization within an individual's musculature. A person with full-length biceps, for instance, does not necessarily possess full-length calves, or anything else for that matter. It is unusual to see a person with uniform muscle size or length over the entire body. The only person I can think of who developed extraordinary muscle mass in all his body parts is Sergio Oliva. Training Requirements and Ultimate Capacity None of the genetic traits described above can be changed by training. Training can, however, enable the individual to reach the upper limits of his or her potential. Even those chosen few, the genetic freaks who possess a superabundance of the required traits, will improve faster and go further if they train and diet intelligently. Only by constantly increasing training intensity can you fulfill your potential. A person of inferior genetic endowment might even surpass one of greater endowment by training properly. 
Since the ultimate capacity to develop is a summation of genetic traits, however, it remains true that superior development will occur when superior genetic endowment is married to intelligent training. If you have been making an honest assessment of your potential over a period of time and believe you are severely limited, don't despair. While it remains an immutable fact that genetic limitations represent a boundary over which we have no control at present, though genetic engineers may learn to manipulate it very soon, an individual's ultimate potential is something that can be assessed with any degree of accuracy only in retrospect. Therefore, don't give up your devotion to hard training and strict dieting, since you'll never really know until you try. Frank Zane, allegedly of lesser genetic endowment, had no way of knowing what the future had in store for him when he began training. It was his unrelenting drive that allowed him to achieve so much in the sport of bodybuilding. Unfortunately, it is true that we can't all be superstars, as nature was stingy in doling out her gifts. What is important is that each and every individual reach full potential, so that he or she can enjoy a rich and rewarding life beyond merely having well-developed muscles.